Hey everybody, welcome back to Video Game Esoteric, and we got a fun video for you today because we're going to be doing a series on reviving a Konami NKWTR arcade board. This is going to be a little bit more general about how to diagnose and troubleshoot problems with your PCBs because it can be a little bit daunting, but I promise you it's not as bad as it seems. And we did talk about Thrill Drive before because it does emulate, but I now have original hardware and it's quite rare, but it is not currently working, so we need to get it working now. If we get too far involved though, do me a huge favor, go down below, hit like, subscribe, Subscribe. That notification bell definitely helps us out. If you feel so inclined and want to support the channel, we got a Patreon link down below as well. Because the cat pen's a member, are you? But just taking a look at the board here, it is quite complex. There are four PCBs in a row. We have a network board, we've got the CPU board, and then we have dual GPU boards with three. 3D effects chips a piece. So there are four boards on this, and what we need to do is figure out what's wrong with it. Because the issue with really rare hardware is this most people have never fixed it. If you have a problem with your CPS2 or your Neo Geo or console wise, the Super Nintendo or Sega Genesis, so many people have fixed it, you'll be able to find the answer. When you get to esoteric hardware like this here with all these different DB25 connectors on it, it is a wild design. You're going to find that if it's broken, you're probably going to be one of the first people ever to have to fix it. But we need to power this thing first because this is not a JAMA board and it is not a JVS board, it is a custom one-off design. So what we have here is a JVS power adapter that goes into that Konami NKWTR board. I'm just going to call it the Konami board from now on because that's a mouthful of letters. And you'll see here I did a video previously, I'll link it down below, about how to adapt an ATX power supply over to JVS. Luckily we have all the connectors that we need to use. But powering rare and exotic boards is the first thing you need to deal with and 99 out of 100 times you're going to have to create a custom harness to do it but luckily we've already done that so let's just get going here you'll see that we have the entire thing connected into that atx power supply now if you get a board in and you're not sure if it's safe or not to power it as long as there's no burning around the power connector you don't see anything visually obvious it's a pretty safe bet you can power it up just be sure that you take a look around really quick and always keep your power supply on a breaker like this, a power strip. Not only do I have the ability to turn it on and off at will, but because it's an ATX power supply, it's going to automatically turn on when it receives power unless there's an off switch. But booting up right now, you're going to see we're going to get into an issue and we're going to find out very quickly what that is. Because on post, we get hardware error negative 11N. Now, what the hell does that mean? The N makes me think that it's part of the network board. But here's the thing when you're troubleshooting. Don't make presumptions. But there is a dual inline package dip switch here. And dip 1 and 2 are turned on. And that skips the actual hardware checks as far as the ROMs are concerned. How do we know that? Well, MAME, when you're repairing things it can be very useful because if you go into the main dips you're going to see it's disable machine initialization and then skip the post process so if you go ahead and turn both of those off this board is now going to try to check everything you'll see these garbled graphics at the beginning you might think there's a problem but that's just how it's supposed to look and moving ahead now we're checking all the individual chips on the board on the cpu board on the network board as well as on the gpu boards and you're going to see things are going to start coming up okay that means every ROM chip or otherwise at that location, and it is silk screen on the board, is working as it should be. So right now we're not seeing anything that's indicating where we should go next because all of this is checking out good. But what it is giving us is information as to what not to have to check on. If something came up as bad, I'd start right there because I would know there was an issue. But after everything passes, the hardware check, negative 11N. So what in the hell is that? And of course, Konami didn't bother to tell us in the manual what those errors are. But because all those chips came up as okay, we know we've eliminated like 99% of what we do need to look at. So now what we need to start looking at, let's take a little peek at this network board because this chip here that supplies the code for these different FPGA chips is socketed and it's been reworked but there's one chip on this board that is not part of the LAN board network check and maybe we should check into that more but you can see that it has been reworked there is flux on the board the one nice thing is Konami leaves these stickers on pretty much all of their boards and that is basically the security code because they have an EEPROM check against a real-time clock and if that fails, the board will not boot. That is what I think is going on here, but I really want to take a look at the rest of the board before I narrow it down too much, but that N really makes me think network. 
And you'll see here the chips are also labeled as far as they are concerned on the board. This is 713B B01. And if you look at the MAME dumps, if you unzip the zip file, you're going to see these chips in there labeled. So if one is bad, we could reburn it from the MAME dumps and restore the board. I will say that this board is not in bad condition, but anytime you're trying to fix something, take a look around. There is some slight pitting and oxidization on these connectors. Now I see absolutely no rust on the board whatsoever, and it's not that weird that these connectors may have gotten a little bit pitted. It's very cheap metal, but this is an indicator that maybe there could be a bigger problem further down the line. But as far as capacitors are concerned, they seem to be working pretty well. So I really think the issue is with this network board and that would not be surprising because Konami loves playing around with these things and I feel like a lot of people threw these away because they thought they were broken. You'll see what checks out okay on the LAN board and I highlighted it there, but if we go to the LAN board, some of the chips on it that are marked are not on that check, so they still could be bad. The first thing we got to do is pop it off. Sometimes boards are held down by these little plastic connectors. Just pinch them at the edges. Be gentle when you take them apart and you should be okay. But just remember, you do want to be careful when you're taking things apart because you don't want to damage them more. And hey, what do we have here? Our old Konami Arcade friend, the real-time clock chip. This chip has a security code on it. And if it is dead or blank, it will not boot. You'll see that there's a little bit of dust on this. And honestly, there is that little bit of flux. But I checked out some of the continuity, I'll show you in a bit. I couldn't find any problems with the rework, so I don't think this board has any mechanical failures as far as the solder work is concerned. But I know someone's already tried to fix this once, and that's what you want to look evidence for. Has someone else been in here? Because trying to fix someone else's work is always the hardest part. But all of these sockets have perfect continuity, and you can see a little tiny burn mark on that plastic edge. Somebody hit it with a soldering iron. This is the evidence we look for. But let's say that there is a slight issue with this network board, even though those three chips came up as okay. Maybe one of the connectors, one of the pins that checks that EEPROM is dirty. So I just come in with some IPA, clean it, and honestly, I couldn't really find much dirt to be concerned about. Everything is clean, everything is nice, so I don't think that we have a bad pin or bad electrical connection. But... Let's check out the rest of the board because there could be an issue that we don't see and I want to take a look at everything before I really decide what avenue to pursue. Always take photos of the connectors. Before you take something apart, photograph it. That way, when you're putting it back together, you'll know what goes where. Trust me, you're going to think you remember, you do not. Just photograph everything and you will be 100%. Now you will see that there are these plastic connectors on the side of the board. These can be delicate. This is how I like to take them apart. I do not use any tools. I use my hand because sometimes plastic can get brittle. Come in with your finger and use your thumb and your index finger. Your index finger is going to give upward pressure while your thumb gently pulls down. And that should easily pop that board and connectors off. If it's not coming off, do not apply more pressure. Just be patient. Now taking a look at the video board here, you're going to see we have those three 3D effects chips as well as the Konami Custom, but this board is loaded up with chips. There could be a problem anywhere. Now I don't think there is because all of the checks came up as good, but there could be an issue with RAM. It is slightly dirty, slightly dusty, but that's because it was in the middle of the sandwich. Nothing visually on the top of this board makes me think there's a problem. Well, let's take a look at the bottom of it as well. This is the CPU board here, and all of a sudden you might start seeing the eagle eyed among you a little bit of a potential problem. There are damage to the bottom of this board. These traces could be broken, and we can repair that if they are, but you want to visually inspect things. If you see gouges in the solder mask like this, you're going to start looking for broken traces. And you'll see that these chips right near where the broken traces are, are not checked on the post procedure. So they could still be bad. But surprisingly, and I thought this may be the problem, I came through and checked continuity on every single one of those traces where the gouges were from one point to another and absolutely everything passed the continuity check. This is not our problem. I was sure this was going to be the issue, but this gouging here just wasn't it. But you always want to check for these things because a single broken trace can be the difference between a board booting and a board not booting. But let's open up the GPU board sandwich because there's two identical boards 
And this again looks pretty much fine on the top. I can't find anything that I'm worried about. And the top GPU board on the bottom, again, nothing that seemed to be an issue. But when I looked at the bottom of the GPU board, we've got some more damage down here. Let me move this leg out of the way. So now again, maybe this is the problem. We have more traces that seem to be gouged out. So we need to check continuity on each and every one of them to make sure there's not a problem. And again, surprisingly, there were no breaks in continuity. Every single trace that had this slight damage to it had continuity from one point to the other, and there were no bridge continuities to a pin left or right. So again, we're in the same situation. It won't boot. But if we think it's the network board, let's start the hardware up without it on, and it immediately 11 ends out again and again. I do think this is the network board, and you see here we have this counter. This is how I was able to find something. Error 10. It says negative 11, but it shows as a 10 on this counter. With some Googling, and trust me, Google's going to be your friend, I found a main blog that listed that they figured out the 11 and error in Racing Jam 2, a game that runs on this, and it's the LAN board EEPROM chip. Exactly what I thought. Now, I did want to still check the board out, but my presumptions were right. It is on this board right here, and it's that tiny little chip on the right. If we take a look at the MAME driver, MAME drivers can be very useful for diagnosing problems on arcade boards, especially Konami real-time clock chips. You're going to see that that EEPROM will throw a hardware error, and there is no dump for that chip. Here's the thing about the Konami boards. They actually repair their own EEPROMs if you hold down the test switch when you start it up. And what I find here is if I actually switch dip 1 and dip 2 in MAME and try to boot this board with the actual LAN check, it's going to fail as bad and it's not going to boot the game. So now we have some options. We could try to use the program ROM from MAME to see if it'll bypass that check or we can try to fix this EEPROM in real time clock error and it is something I am familiar with. But that's going to be part 2. This board can probably be revived and I think we're going to be able to get there, but if you are trying to troubleshoot hardware, this video is both specific about this hardware as well as some of the thought process of diagnosing anything. You want to take a look at everything, you want to try to see if there's any physical damage, and if there is no physical damage that has broken traces or is otherwise so visually apparently broken uh, that you know why it won't boot, at least you can narrow options down because I was pretty sure this was the network board, but now that I've gone through the entire board, I've checked the chips, I've checked continuity, and I've done some research, I know that network board is killing us. So stay tuned for part two where we try to revive this thrill drive Konami NKWTR board and hopefully get it to play Racing Jam and Racing Jam Chapter 2. If you have any questions or comments, I'll leave them down below, but we'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye.